Lecture today is on development economics and what is the contribution um, of the Austrian school to that subject or that field of inquiry. Uh, I'd like to start the lecture with a little story. Um, so, you know, Nathan Rothschild was uh, a very big and famous uh, banker, businessman, financier. Um, so in 1836, and this is one, you know, he's one of the richest men in the world at this point in time. Um, so in 1836, he travels from London to Frankfurt um, for the wedding, you know, for his son's wedding. Um, and when he, before he leaves, he has a little boil or an abscess, you know, on his lower back. Um, he says, you know what, it's not a big deal. So this is June of 1836. He goes to London, uh, he goes to Frankfurt, um, celebrates the wedding, um, has, you know, and in the, in the meantime, this, ab this boil is just getting worse. Um, and um, he has many doctors come to take a look at it, very famous doctors, the leading experts in the field of the day, and so on. Um, and by the end of July of 1836, he's dead. Right um, now, it we know now that basically he died of a very common sort of bacterial infection, which today um, anybody would could go to a doctor or a pharmacy and just take a medicine over the counter, and you know you'd be fine. And this is the richest man in the world, one of the richest men in the world, right? That sort of summarizes what development economics tries to study. All right. We're, this is what development economists are trying to analyze, which is how do we get from there to here? How is it that the average um, person today in many parts of the world enjoys a standard of living that is higher than the Rothschilds um, or Medici um, or you know the Louis Louis the Sixteenth um, or the richest you know the the, mil the millionaires in Rome. Right? How, how, is, how did this happen? Right? How did we get from there to here? And also, the, other, the sort of flip side of that question is also, why didn't it happen in so many parts of the world? Right? So today, you could, take, you could go into parts of India, parts of Africa, uh, parts of Latin America, and it's like going into a time machine. Right? Going through a time machine, you're lo looking at how people lived you know, three, four hundred years ago. And so the question is, why didn't it happen to them? So what's, what's, what's the problem? And, and that sort of summarizes what the subject is broadly about. And, uh, you know, development economists talk a lot about indicators, all sorts of figures you look at per capita income, um, you know, all sorts of mortality figures, um, health indicators, um, all of this stuff. Uh, but really, that, those are all symptoms, right? Um, we're looking for the deeper causes, right? And this is a, this is a, a question that's, that all the great minds in economics have sort of thought about, because how can you not think about this? Um, the classical economists had a lot to say about it. Um, and you know, basically their main conclusion, which, I, which can be summed up in this quote, quotation from Adam Smith, uh, from his very famous chapter on the division of labor right at the beginning of the wealth of nations, um, is that, look, Growth or development, um, economic improvements in living standards, etc., uh, is largely the result of an extension in the division of labor. Right. So the more you have specialization, the more you have the division of labor. Right. The great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts in consequence of the division of labor, which occasions in a well-governed society that universal opulence which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. This largely was the story or this, uh, the, the sort of answer that you know, Adam Smith gave and with him many classical economists um, gave as well. So what really is the Austrian contribution to the story? I think it can be summarized in this quotation from Karl Menger. Um, in, from his principles of economics. Now, Menger actually criticizes Smith in the first chapter um, of the principles, uh, or well, objects to certain you know, aspects of Smith's treatment of the extension of the division of labor. Um, and he says, look, before you know, this, the excerpt from here, in the same section, he says, look, I mean, let's imagine you have a tribe somewhere um, isolated and you, know, you have more division of labor, uh, more, you know, so you specialize in gathering berries, you specialize in, you know, fishing, you specialize in um, these different sorts of activities that you had been engaging in before. Of course, you would see an improvement in 
standards of living, you would see improvements in productivity um, and all of those things that Adam Smith spoke about. But you would not imagine that that, you know, that, that, those, that set of people is going to develop into a modern, you know, developed economy, right? So something is missing here. And this is what he says is missing in that treatment um, of Adam Smith. And he says, look, what actually happens and what is really the, the primary sort of driving force behind grow, growth and development is a, what you can call a vertical division of labor. So yes, you have to have division of labor, but that, that division of labor and specialization has to extend vertically, not just horizontally, if you will, right? You have to basically specialize in more and more what we would call higher order goods, right? Capital goods, the production, the goods that are not used directly in pro producing consumer goods, but which are themselves used in producing other right, uh, factors of production. And it's through that process of this vertical extension of the division of labor, as you have longer and longer production processes that are employed, you have a more capital intensive um, economy, that's how you have growth. That's the main engine or the main driver um, really of growth. And in, in this long sort of quote, that's really what he's saying. He's saying, look, um, so he says, assume a people which extends its attention to goods of third, fourth, and higher orders instead of confining its activity merely to the tasks of a primit primitive collecting um, economy. Um, we shall see the hunter who initially pursues game with a club turning to hunting with a bow and hunting net, to st stock farming of the simplest kind, um, and in sequence to ever more intensive forms of stock farming uh, we shall see men living initially on wild plants, turning to ever more intensive forms of agriculture. We shall see the rise of manufacturers and their improvement by means of tools and machines. And in the closest connection with these developments, we shall see the welfare of this people um, increase. So really, uh, the main, what I would uh, argue, the main contribution that Austrian, the Austrian school of thought can make to this whole subject of development is really everything to do with the capital structure, um, extending the capital structure, right? What does that entail? What are the conditions that are needed for this to occur? What Menger is describing here, right? What are the preconditions that are needed for this to take place, right? When, when, when will it happen, right? When will it not happen? And this really is uh, the gonna be the focus of my um, talk today, right? Now, just to, to get some basic concepts at hand, I'm sure, uh, many of you have probably already encountered these in earlier lectures, uh, but you know we can perform a thought experiment uh, and and look at Robinson Crusoe, or if you wish, you could think of Tom Hanks and Castaway. I wouldn't, but that's up to you. Um, not a great movie. Uh, so you have this guy stranded on an island. He can produce two goods, right? Fish and berries. Um, as of now, he's adopting very primitive, rudimentary methods. So he just wades into the ocean to catch the fish, and he just climbs trees, or he jumps up and down to gather the berries. Um, his productivity is low, right? He acquires a very small bundle of goods for the time that he devotes to production. Um, so the question is, well, how can he acquire a larger bundle of these consumer goods? How can he grow his little economy, right? And you can talk about it with, you know, using the simple diagram of the production possibilities frontier, right? Um, you have basically uh, amounts of one good on the y-axis, amounts of the other good on the x-axis. And what you're really saying is, look, a point like point N on the, uh, in the box on the left there is something that is unattainable, right, for Robinson um, right now. So given his sort of techniques that he's adopting, given the amount of time he's spending, right, he can only acquire, if he, you know, he can only acquire goods that are on the line or inside the frontier, how do you get to that point outside the frontier? That's really the question uh, that we're asking. Now, of course, one way for him to do this would just be to work harder, right? So use the same rudimentary techniques and keep working harder and harder, but obviously there's a limit to how much, right, his little economy can grow um, doing this. Well, this would mean that he's not really becoming more productive, right? The amount of goods produced per hour worked would still be the same, he's adopting the same techniques, but he's just working longer hours um, in doing that. But he could also do, push his PPF out and get at those points that were earlier unattainable, right, by actually boosting his productivity, right? And the first thing that he needs is, of course, ideas. He needs to know, 
Right? He needs to know of another technique, another production technique um, that can sort of get him to those, to, to, that can boost his productivity, right? So if he doesn't know of any other way of gathering fish except wading into, his, into the ocean and gathering it with his bare hands, well, then he's stuck. He can't really do anything, right? And the same for berries, right? He needs to know that there are these other techniques available, okay? So let's say he knows that, well, all right, I can build a raft in a net and I can go and catch fish which lie, you know, probably uh, in a part of the ocean that is deeper. Uh, the fish come there because they like it, whatever. And at my net, using my net, I can gather a lot of, lot more fish per hour, right? Work, right? I can really boost my productivity, right? And the same thing, he can probably use a stick, build a stick and then, uh, you know, shake off berries in a more productive fashion, right? This way he's again growing his economy, but he's doing it by boosting his productivity. But just having better ideas is not enough for him to actually do that, right? So here you can see we're really talking about what Menger is talking about, right? Was talking about, which is you're, you're going to devote some of your time, not just to producing consumer goods, but you're going to take some of that time and produce these capital goods, like the raft and the net and the stick, and then use those to produce the consumer goods, all right? So if you have to move from this shorter process, which is the more rudimentary process, to a longer process, which involves more steps, more stages, but also more time, right? So the moment at which you begin producing, right, your fish with the raft and the net is going, the fish lies further away in the future as compared to when you can just go in into the ocean, wade and gather the fish, all right? So it's not just enough for him to have this better idea and then begin, he can't just simply embark on this longer process, right? There is some other cost involved, which is basically an intertemporal choice, right? He basically has to choose between consumption in the present versus consumption in the future, all right? Now, he essentially has to choose between two processes, one of which will give him fish in the nearer future, which is wading into the ocean, the other one is going to give him fish in the further, you know, further away into the future. But the second one, the one that's going to give him fish further away into the future is more productive, right? And so when it's more productive, right, he can basically get more stuff, improve his well-being, but it lies further away. So it's an intertemporal choice, all right? And so really the only way he can embark on these longer processes is if he gives up the consumption in the present. All right, so the first precondition really to embarking on these longer, more productive processes that are more capital intensive is really to give up present consumption, right? Or to reduce present consumption below the maximum level that it could otherwise attain, all right? So in other words, he would have to save and invest. That's what you know, saving involves giving up the present consumption. Investing means reallocating those resources away to embarking on these longer processes. So he's investing his labor time in the production of the raft and the net and the berries instead of using it to produce consumer goods directly. All right, so that is his trade-off. Along with having better technology, you also need to save and invest in order to grow your capital structure and to boost your productivity um, in this way. Now, to sort of better classify or better understand this process, Menger came up with his classification of goods of various orders, um, something again which I'm sure you're familiar with. So he called the consumer goods the goods of the first order or first order goods, right? Producer goods are higher order goods, but those goods don't can, can be classified into various subgroups, right? Based on how far they are temporally from consumption. Okay, so you have the producer goods can themselves be divided into second order, third order, fourth order goods, et cetera. Now a second order producer good would be a good that is used in the production of the consumer good. So in our example, the raft and the net would be a second order good, right? And the same with the, the, the stick that is that you use to shake the berries off the tree, that would be a second order good along with the labor that is used to produce the consumer good, fish or berries. But the labor that is used to produce the raft and the net along with whatever other materials you might use are third order goods and so on, right? Depending on how complex your production structure happens to be. Um, and so we can basically, we can say that growing this capital structure, growing this production structure vertically or engaging in, a, in the extension of a vertical division of labor involves devoting 
time towards the production of goods that are of higher and higher orders. All right, so basically a more developed economy in this Robinson Crusoe world. So, you know, imagine that you're the producers of one of those shows, right? Was that Lost or Survivor? So you place two guys on two islands and then you're looking from the helicopter, right? And looking at how, they, how they're doing. Well, one of the guys you find spends a large part of his labor time not devoted directly towards the production of consumer goods, right? Instead, what does he do? He spends part of his day sort of building a raft and net, part of his day maybe constructing a house, part of his, you know, maybe building a bow and arrow, et cetera. And the other guy is just goes, wades into the ocean, and then, you know, he gazes at the stars or, you know, dances around a fire or talks to a volleyball or whatever, right? <laughs> so we would call the, 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 person, the Robinson, who is engaging in these longer production processes, who's devoting his time more towards the production of higher order goods as the more developed, as having the more developed economy, as having engaged in a, a greater extension of this vertical, right, division of labor. And remember that it's not a one-shot process, right? Capital goods depreciate. That's the other distinguishing characteristics of capital goods. So the raft and the net, once produced, is not going to keep you know, giving forth the higher productivity forever. At some point, it's going to be useless. So not only does this Robinson, who is more developed, who, is, you know, engage, who, who engages in these more productive production processes, not only would he have to produce these capital goods once, he's probably going to have to keep producing them to replace them. Right? So as the raft and the net depreciates, he's going to have to devote some time towards building a new raft in the net, right? And the same thing with the stick, and same thing with, his, with, with the bow and arrow that maybe he uses to uh, catch, uh, hunt meat or a game or whatever, right? Um, and so really, it's how you allocate their labor time across these different orders of goods that distinguishes whether you have a more capital intensive or, or, or a greater vertical division of labor or not. And in, in fact, if you think about it in a modern developed economy like the one we live in, the vast majority of labor, labor time, for example, is used not in producing consumer goods directly, right? Most people are engaged in the production of consumer goods or, or in production processes that will only give consumer goods or give forth consumer goods many, many years into the future. Right? Think, for example, about people thinking about or, or sort of researching into nanotechnology now. Right? What's that production process look like? 20 years? Right? 25 years? We don't even know. Right? And there are so many others, not just in the US, but literally now because we live in an international right, economy where most of the goods, a lot of the goods we're, we're consuming today are being produced in China, uh, you know, in, um, in Vietnam. Um, et cetera. One of my favorite pastimes when I go shopping with my wife, uh, she'll know. I, I was going to say, don't tell her I say this, but you know, now she'll know. Is there, <laughs> is, is actually going around looking at, like you go to Target and just go around, look at all where the stuff is made and you'll be fascinated. You know, a lot of it is from China, yes. And that gets boring after some time, but you have Philippines, you have Vietnam, you have Bangladesh, you have countries all over the world. And the point being that it's, it's this vertical division of labor has now become an international phenomenon. So not just are people in uh, the U.S. spending, you know, the large proportion of labor time in the U.S. is being spent in these long production processes, but all over the world, right? Someone in China now is probably, or someone in Egypt now is probably growing cotton, which will become a shirt, I don't know, four or five years from now, right? Someone in China is doing, is working on a production process that will yield you uh, a smartphone, I don't know, two years from now, right? So uh, that's really what we're talking about here. Right, so that's, you know, so this is, I think the, the benefit of the Robinson Crusoe uh, thought construct is it sort of helps you focus your mind on and, and you know, wor not worry about many of the inessential details and sort of convey the basic message. So, you know, if, uh, it's the same thing, you're talking about two Robinsons, right? You'll find one guy using his time very differently, but also having a much higher standard of living um, in, in terms of the actual goods that can be consumed, right? The other guy might very well have, you know, spending more leisure time, uh, but, but the, you know, the bundle of the richer Robinson will have a much greater flow of fish, of, gay, of meat, um, you know, he'll live in a better house, etc., right? And that's really, in a sense, um, what we're talking about when we talk about a developed or you know better developed economy and a less well developed economy. Now this 
um, is an example um, of the production of bread, right, in the developed countries in the 20th century. As you can see here, a lot of goods of various orders go into producing bread, something very mundane, simple, something we take for granted, right? Um, and so, like, for example, the seventh order here um, would consist of agricultural machinery, fertilizers, chemical plants, right, used in this process. Um, and, you know, you have a sixth order, fifth order, et cetera, all of it flowing and sort of interlocking one with the other until you have your, the flow of your final consumer good, which is, which is bread. Um, and if you compare the production of bread in rural North India in the mid 20th century, you can see um, sort of, you still have seven orders of goods, but you, if you look at the sort of the, the quality and the kind of goods and the, the number of goods in this capital structure against this, you can see that this is far more rudimentary, right? Um, and uh, obviously the, the final product is also going to differ in quality as compared to uh, the developed country example. Now these uh, examples or these, these charts of these orders are I took from uh, a book by Sudha Shanoi. Um, it's available on Mises.org. Um, I believe it's called An Outline for International Economic History. Um, and it, the whole book is basically develops uh, and, and looks to apply, you know, this notion of a vertical division of labor and analyze, uh, you know, different growth um, episodes, especially that of England. And this is another example. This is late 20th century cotton garments in developed countries. Again, you can see so the final product is cotton garments, but you can see how many different orders and sort of different capital goods sort of go into creating that final product, which is available when you just walk into the store, right? Um, and you can see here also, I don't know if all of you can read it, but you know, some of these things are made in, U in the UK, some in the US, some in Germany, um, some in Japan, so some in China, right? So it's, like, it's an international um, process uh, going on here. Right, so the, this is one of, so to boil it down along with the, so one of the main preconditions of engaging in, you know, this extending this division of labor vertically that Menger spoke about is saving, right? Um, and so it's not just enough to know, um, or to have better technology, have better ideas, but you also need to actually have savings available. Um, this is a point in which, on which the Austrian school differs uh, uh, from, what you'd, what you'd call neoclassical or mainstream growth theory, which emphasizes more the technological aspect um, of growth. Now, of course, the technological aspect is important. You also need a growth of ideas. You need better and better ideas, um, you know, about how to improve your productivity, how to engage in different production processes. That is important, but that's not sufficient, right? Uh, that, if you wish, that would be a necessary condition, but a sufficient condition has to be the actual availability of savings. Um, and Rothbard, in a quote from Man Economy State, says, look, what is lacking in these developing countries is not knowledge of Western technological methods, uh, know-how, that is learned easily enough. Uh, the service of imparting knowledge in person or in book form can be paid for readily, what is lacking is a supply of saved capital needed to put the advanced methods into effect. The African peasant will gain little from looking at pictures of American tractors. What he lacks is the saved capital needed to purchase them. That is the important limit on his investment and on his um, production, right? So uh, what Rothbard is saying here is I think an important point, which is he's saying, look, if you look at a developing country um, or parts of the world that are less developed, ideas are out there, right? They can learn about the more advanced production technology that is being adopted right now in more developed parts of the world. But what they lack is the capital, right? What they lack is the savings. So just differences in the, in, in the knowledge of technology is not enough to explain why we've had improved growth in certain parts of the world, but not in other parts of the world, right? We have to talk about savings and the need to save um, and invest. All right, so the second sort of aspect of, or the second precondition, so we need savings, uh, but the second precondition is really, goes to the heart of, look, how do you put together such a complex structure um, in a non-chaotic fashion, right? So again, going back to some of those, these examples here, look at the number of goods, right? Firstly, the is bewildering. Um, look at how geographically dispersed their production is, all right? 
look at how many different orders there are, how does this thing mesh, right? How, how, does this, how does this not lead to chaos? How is it that producers who are geographically uh, and temporally so dispersed from the final consumer good that's available, how do they all know what to produce, right? How, do, how does the system work, right? For example, I mean, you walk into the store, right? So this is clothing. You walk into the store, you have a shirt. You want a shirt, it's there. Right? How did you tell the guy growing the cotton that you wanted the shirt? Well, you didn't like, he's not your Facebook friend or anything, right? You didn't like give him a call and say, well, five years from now, or right now I want a shirt. Well, anyway, it's not going to happen because the production process takes time, but you didn't, you don't like call up somebody and say, well, five years from now, I'm going to want a shirt. This is my size, right? This is the color I want, make it. It doesn't work like that, right? So how does this system work? What are the preconditions needed to make this, this what you can call an investment chain, right? Which is sort of, I think a word that Ludwig Lachmann used to describe these complex production processes involving many different orders of goods. How does this investment chain that finally yields consumer goods, how does it mesh? How does it dovetail? How, how does, do these different parts fit together, all right? What are the main or the essential precondition for that to occur? And here we have to dig into the whole argument about economic calculation, all right? Um, now, when, it, when you're talking about a simple production process or a simple economy like Robinson Crusoe's economy, right, he, w when he's making decisions about which good to produce, uh, whether to use a shorter or a longer process, right? He doesn't really need prices to make that decision. Why? Why, why doesn't he need prices? Well, because he, the production processes are so simple that he can easily compare what he's getting and what he's giving up. So he's not engaging in a whole bunch of production processes, right? He's probably, you know, he, when, when he's thinking about, well, should I build a raft in the net? or not, well, what does he forego? Probably fish in the present, right? Uh, similarly, he might face a decision about, well, what production process should I use to produce cloth? Well, given the simplicity of his economy, right? Given the short production processes involved, given how few the different, you know, production processes he's engaged in at a particular point in time, he can easily compare what is the value that he's gaining right, the value of the good that he's gaining in terms of consumer goods and what is the consumer good that he's giving up, right? So he can easily make a decision, okay, well, uh, you know, my, and again, uh, you probably come across the concept of time preference, but in this case, we'd say, well, you know, once he knows, well, this is uh, the, the, the fish that he's gonna get from the longer process, this is how much fish he's gonna get from the shorter process, if he has a low enough rate of time preference, he will embark on the longer process. But the main point is that he can easily compare marginal benefit and opportunity cost or value obtained and value foregone without engaging um, in, you know, without needing prices. Now, that is only going to be true, right, for a simple rudimentary economy, right? He can engage in this sort of simple analysis of satisfaction obtained versus satisfaction foregone anytime he has to make these production uh, decisions. But for a complex economy, right, the, the, the situation is very different. So think, for example, about somebody who's making a decision about whether or not to, pr or how to use, say, a unit of coal, right, in a very complex economy where you have coal can be used in thousands of different production processes. Each of those production processes, all right, uh, will involve, coal can be used in producing a good of a different order, Right? They will all produce different consumer goods at varying points in future time. Right? Now, technology can tell you, well, okay, this, these are the options in front of you. But when you are using coal and say you're comparing using coal in producing, say, uh, electricity and producing steel, you can't compare the value of electricity and steel. These are not, they don't, they're higher order goods. They're, they're producer goods. They don't, they don't satisfy your wants, right? They are not used by you to directly satisfy your wants. They're used to produce other consumer goods, right? Through different, so electricity itself could be used in another thousand different production processes. Same with steel, right? So in order to be able to compare the satisfaction that you could potentially obtain from one path that you choose with that one unit of coal and compare that to the satisfaction that you would lose with whatever it is that you're giving up, right? would involve 
thinking through these extremely complex chains of production all the way through into the future before you make this decision. Well, it's literally impossible for, you know, for a human being to do that, right? And you would have to do that at every point whenever you make a decision with respect to any higher order good, right? Because if your higher order good itself is producing different higher order goods, you can't compare their satisfaction, right? So this is where you need prices and this is where the whole question of economic calculation comes in. So you cannot engage, so in other words, in a complex market economy, no producer, no entrepreneur is sort of working his way through every production process from you know, where the good that he's producing is to consumer goods in order to sort of say, well, how much value am I generating for consumers if I choose this path versus that path, right? That's not what entrepreneurs do. Whatever goods they are producing, they think of, well, what is the money, what is the revenue I can generate, right? By selling it to my potential customers, right? And at the same time, what do I have to pay the factors of production, which would be his opportunity cost, okay? So he can use money prices in order to simplify this decision, right? But at the same time, these prices help are what help in dovetailing or in sort of meshing together this complex capital structure. Because basically uh, the prices of these higher order goods are all ultimately derived from the prices of the consumer goods, right? But it, it doesn't occur in any one, through the actions of any one entrepreneur. It, actually, it happens through the actions of thousands of entrepreneurs all operating in their own limited fields as they're making their production decisions, right? So this is another huge contribution from the Austrian, of the Austrian school to development economics, which is to say, well, if you want, you know you want to develop, you know you want to grow. Well, the, the main thing you need to do is to engage in this, extending this division of labor vertically. Well, the main, one of the main preconditions for that is saving, but the other main precondition is to have a working price system. Well, what do you have how, how can you have a working price system if you have certain institutional conditions in place, which is largely the institutional conditions of private property, right? And so, right, so basically these entrepreneurs who are all working using prices, right, in their calculations, in talking about whether, you know, their decision making and using the profit loss system to finally know whether or not you know, they're making the right or the wrong decision, right? All these decisions happening throughout, not just any one country now, but throughout the world, all mesh together to ensure that you have a smooth flow of goods from all through the various orders down into the consumer goods, right? It is this price system that helps the different entrepreneurs in all the different stages and all producing all the different orders of goods actually dovetail their decisions one with the other. Right, so that you have a smooth flow. Uh, of course, those institutional conditions right, must be in place, which is the institutional condition of private property. Right? Um, and once you have these, a legal system or a system or, or some other uh, you know, way in which these no private property norms are enforced, right, those are the esen essential institutional prerequisites for engaging in this extending extension of the vertical um, division of labor, which basically implies that the further away you are from it, and of course, you know, the, the furthest away you can get from it is a pure socialist system, right? The, the less the chances for development to occur, right? And to a large extent, despite the phenomenally high growth rates coming out of the Soviet Union, right? If you read about the lives of the daily person, in the Soviet Union, it consisted essentially of waiting in line, right? And, and that sort of that sort of tells you something, right? So you have you do have a lot of investment. You did have a lot of investment in the Soviet economy, right? You had an increased production of cap many capital goods, but that didn't really trickle down into an increase in the quality and the quantity of the different consumer goods, right? That is a capital structure that is broken, that is disintegrated, that does not fit together to do its job. Right? And the reason for that is because of the lack of a well-functioning price system. Of course, even the Soviet economy was not purely socialist. Um, it could still use money prices um, in its calculations 
um, largely international um, prices, but also you had black markets, etc. all of that stuff. Um, but it was very far away from having the necessary institutional conditions that guard, safeguard a private property, especially in producer goods and higher order um, goods. Now, I want to take, um, right, did I, right, so the other point which one should mention here is really that of GDP accounting, okay, so often, as was the case with the Soviet Union, but also in other cases, I will talk about the Indian case briefly um, here, GDP does not give us the whole story if we want to know about growth and development, right, because of the fact that you can have increased production of capital goods, which don't really give you and yield you an increased production of consumer goods, which ultimately is what we all care about, right? So the increased production of the different capital goods might go in and increase the GDP numbers, but they don't necessarily increase and improve the per capita living standards in terms of the actual consumer goods that are available, right, within that economy. So again, when your capital structure disintegrates or it does not fit together, Right, you can have a lot of investment in these higher order goods, but they don't all fit together. Right, these investment chains don't yield you what they're supposed to yield, right, which is an increasing variety and quality of consumer goods and quantity of consumer goods. Right. <clears throat> all right. So the Indian case, um, I have about ten minutes. I think that will be about enough time to go through it quickly. Um, now, for those who don't know much about in, uh, Indian history. India was independent, gained independence from the British in 1947, and soon after that, uh, sort of instituted a planning commission. Got uh, you know, got uh, five-year plans that came out every five years, um, and this was largely from about 1950 till about 1991 when the reforms kicked in. Uh, now, of course, the five-year plans started meaning a lot less even by the 1980s. Uh, but the really, the, the heyday of planning or the height of planning was immediately after gaining independence, which was in the 50s, 60s, and really the 70s. Um, now again, the Indian economy was not a purely socialist economy in the sense that it did not completely eliminate the markets um, for uh, the higher order um, goods. Uh, in fact, the Indian economy is sort of a, str uh, a strange case, but also an interesting one because they didn't even nationalize everything. Um, so what the Indian, uh, so by the way, the, what the, the reason for engaging in this whole exercise was to try and produce everything within the Indian border, right, with, within India. Okay, so economic nationalism or economic self-sufficiency was, was the goal. And the, the planners believed that if you did that, you would have higher rates of growth and higher and improve living standards more than if you engaged in the international division of labor, right, and kept the markets open, right, kept the Indian markets open to international competition, um, et cetera. Now, of course, if you want to produce everything within your own country, you have to socialize, right? Because you basically have to control the production of literally everything if you want to achieve that objective. Now, and, and this is a quote from Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the first prime minister of independent India, and also a very prominent uh, leader of the freedom movement from the British. Um, and he says, well, I believe in, in one of his speeches, he says, well, I believe as a practical proposition that it is better to have a second rate thing made in our country than a first rate thing that one has to import. Well, I mean, with that sort of objective and philosophy, it's hardly surprising that you know, they didn't really weigh the costs and benefits of doing this. That's exactly what he's saying. Anyway, that was sort of the overall um, philosophy, but th I think this from, uh, this, the gentleman here is P.C. Mahala Nobis, who was sort of the intellectual, the brain behind uh, Indian planning, especially in the early days in the 50s. Um, he was a physicist and a statistician, a sort of a, a, a polymath uh, who also dabbled in economics, unfortunately. Um, and, and he, uh, Nehru, who was the architect of, uh, you know, most of all this, uh, the planning apparatus, he had high, you know, really liked this guy. Um, so he was, he was one of his main advisors. So this is sort of him laying out in, again, one of his, uh, his papers, you know, wh what, why are we doing this? And he says, look, why do we then import machinery? Because we have not started factories to fabricate heavy machinery needed for the production of steel, cement, etc. Once we do this and establish a heavy machine building industry, we shall be able to use our own iron ore and with our own hands produce steel and then use the steel to produce more machinery. Our dependence on foreign supplies will be greatly reduced 
the main ob obstacle to rapid industrialization thus removed, we shall be able to increase production and employment um, quickly. Now, of course, one has to keep in mind that a lot of this happened with the backdrop of colonialism. So, uh, you know, when when the Indians gained independence from the British, one of the main sort of conclusions that all the intellectuals in India had come to was, well, what kept us growing, or what didn't grow the Indian economy was the fact that the Brits were here, right? And the fact that they, uh, that, that these, we were integrated into this international division of labor. Um, and so like, like Mahal Nobis says, the main obstacle to rapid industrialization thus removed. So in other words, economic, Self-sufficiency, greater economic self-sufficiency, greater nationalism economically will lead to higher rates of growth and more rapid industrialization. Well, of course, as you can see, and I think this lays it down pretty well, if you have to do that, you have to socialize or at least control in one way or the other what is being produced within the country. Now, the way the Indian planners did it was not necessarily through nationalizing everything. There were political obstacles to that. Um, but what they did was had a very intense system of regulation um, and uh, licensing by which they more or less controlled everything that was produced in what you could call the formal economy. Of course, you had this informal economy um, where production processes were you know, low scale uh, enterprises, very small scale, carrying on production largely uh, outside the system, but within what you can call the formal economy, uh, private producers, they were private in a legal sense, but not private in an economic sense, really, right? They were all sort of uh, hemmed in by these regulations. You had industrial licensing, you had foreign uh, exchange licensing, you couldn't import inputs on, without going through a long process of getting different licenses, et cetera, et cetera. That's how uh, the, the planners sought to control um, you know, production in, in many ways, like a wartime economy, right? Uh, that's probably what happened. And in, and it's, it's interesting that lots of these controls were actually carried forward from World War II, right? That they just, you know, for all the, 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 all the crying about the fact that the Brits did such a, you know, oppressed us so much, uh, they just carried those controls over from World War II down into independent, um, India, right? Um, so what happened and, I'm looking at the period between 55 and 65. Now, this period again has a had a ra rather high rate of GDP growth. Um, it's not anything high by Soviet standards. It was about four, 4.2 percent per annum over 1950 to about 1965. Um, per capita GDP growth was about 2 percent, 2.1 percent. By Indian standards, that was very high. So compared to pre-colonial, uh, you know, the colonial days, it was very high. All right, uh, so the planner said, look, this is great. GDP is growing, this is what we want, this is what we, uh, uh, we wanted to do, this is what rapid industrialization is all about. Um, and well, you can see that how they allocated resources during these uh, 10 years, especially very little to agriculture, very little to food grain, uh, very little to consumer goods industries, a lot to capital goods and basic industry are also sort of higher order goods, right? So the growth rates of those industries was far higher than the growth rates of uh, the consumer goods industries. Well, what happened was a stagnation of living standards. So basically by 1965-66, uh, India was on the brink of famine, right? And it was saved largely through loans of wheat made by America. And it's funny, um, and one of, uh, you know, so a commentator on the Indian economy uh, said, look, you have the world's most industrial nation helping out the world's most agrarian nation with food, right? Uh, that's what happened at the end of this 15 uh, year period by 65, 66. Uh, you can see that the actual level of per capita availability of food grain per, uh, you know, per day actually declined, right? Um, and the per capita availability of cotton cloth also barely increased. Uh, and even when it did, you know, even most of the increase was just getting back to pre-war standards. So basically, you didn't have any improvement in the two main goods that at that time were the biggest sort of uh, goods in the consumption basket of the average Indian, all right? Uh, but you had a lot of increased, you know, investment in all of these higher order goods. But when you come down to the consumer goods, it's a trickle, all right? And the same thing, actually continues in the 70s um, as well. It's not like these investments are paying dividends all of a sudden um, in the 1970s. So again, another example of when, uh, you know, when you don't have a working price system, how this, this structure doesn't work. Now, this is a neat way of actually putting it, uh, uh, putting it graphically. So you see here that on the left-hand side is, this is what is supposed to happen when you invest more, right, in higher order goods. You 
So you have your PPF, you give up agricultural production, which usually tends to be low, you know, uh, which are usually lower order goods, closer to consumption. You invest more in industrial production, especially your higher order uh, goods, and then your PPF moves out, right? You, you're able to have higher standards of living in the future. That's what is supposed to happen. When in highly socialist or highly regulated environments, you do the same thing, what happens is this on the right. This is what happened in the Soviet economy, um, and you could say this is what happened in the Indian economy during that period, uh, or something like this, which is basically your PPF actually collapses because you basically consume your capital, right? When you invest in these higher order goods and these capital goods don't fit together and they don't yield what they're supposed to yield, it's just, con it's just capital consumption, right? You're just engaged in a lot of mass capital consumption, similar to, for example, what happens in war, right? Um, like Bob, H or, you know, Bob Higgs' great um, essay on uh, World War II where he sort of debunks the whole notion that you've had rates of high rates of growth, uh, and that's what lifted you out of the, uh, the Great Depression. Well, what's he saying there? He's saying, look, of course you had more investment, more capital formation, but what were they producing? They were producing war uh, material. That's not consumption, right? That's not consumer goods. So in a sense, all of those resources are consumed, in a sense, but not in a way that actually improves standards of living. Some, so your PPF actually collapses inside. The capacity to produce right, consumer goods actually falls when you invest in this inappropriate fashion, right? Um, well, yep, I think that's it. And I think my time's up, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs>